So, when we talk about sonoanatomy, we have to talk about tissues and anatomy in general, and not only nerves. This is something I always want to stress. Of course, you're going for nerves as a dual regional, but it's not only nerve. Why do we need anatomy? To my opinion, it's the key uh, to succeed in regional anesthesia, but only if you know that um, you have a general knowledge of anatomy, the organs, and if you have a knowledge about tissues, the regular anatomy of tissues, you will understand what I call sonomorphology. It's not only sonoanatomy, what you see in a picture. And the topography in general, of course, but not only nerves again. And one thing which is absolutely necessary to understand regional anesthesia and ultrasound application is variability. And as Sir William Osler said, variability is the law of life, and no two bodies are the same, and this is very much true. So it comes to an individual anatomy, and that's the advantage of using ultrasound. If you put the probe and if you have an understanding of anatomy and topography, you know the one is different from the other and you can act differently or adapt your actions in ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. So it's definitely the key to understand and to succeed in regional anesthesia if you know anatomy. First of all, a sort of introduction about echogenicity. A lot of you know about that. Just a brief reminder. We are talking about hyperechoic and hypoechoic. What's hyperechoic? Connective tissue, fasciae, bony surfaces, very beautifully seen here, for example, bony surfaces, and vessel walls, seen here in the axillary artery, and tendons and ligaments. This will be stuff for the MSK if you uh, attend that uh, starting on Sunday. And nerves, of course, but hypoechoic are fatty tissue, which is very important. Not all fat tissue is hypoechoic. I can warn you. For example, if you do MSK ultrasound, there are a lot of fat pads. They're hyperechoic. But again, not uh, relevant, most relevant for regional. Fluids, of course, and of course, your local anesthetic you, you apply. Muscles, tendons, ligaments, they're in brackets because not all of them are really hypo or hyper, depending on your scanning uh, expertise. And nerves again. And this is very typically seen here. Dark nerves between two muscles, it's the interscaling groove, and a very bright nerve within a muscle. So these are the two extremes, almost no echoes or very bright. So nerves are both for a patient. And also artifacts are important, and there will be a lecture on artifacts, and I will not go into detail, but very important. Uh, there are muscles, tendons, fascia, ligaments, organs, and nerves. So it's always a mixture of a lot of tissues. And as you may see, uh, with these brown circles, muscles look very different throughout the body. And tendons, for example, not all of the tendons look really hyperechoic. And they produce also lateral shadowing, which is probably not so well known. It's not only vessels that produce that artifact. And again, nerves. In two pictures, again, two different echogenic nerves. The one is oval, the other is round. And artifacts all over the screen, and you can't really uh, avoid those artifacts. For example, if you go to the cubital fossa, you will see there's a more or less dark area, and this should be a, a, a tendon, a biceps tendon. Only if you have a cross-section, you see the structure very bright. And if you have tendons or nerves within musculature, they act as an acoustic window, and regularly they are very, very perfectly seen. So if it comes to nerves, we have to have a look uh, at the nervous tissue and the connective tissue. And this gives a typical picture, a mixture of seeing fascicles, they're black, and seeing connective tissues, which is white. Very beautifully seen here. All those black bubbles are uh, nervous tissue. In between, there's perineurium and, in most cases, an outer sheath, which is the epineurium seen in ultrasonography. Be aware of the fact that in the vicinity of nerves, there are other tissues, like fat, for example, and they may look very similar to nerves. So what it comes to uh, the bottom is having pattern of nerves more than echogenicity or shape of a nerve or form of different things. And this is a picture histologically where you see the fascicles, and you see the fascicles in different uh, nerves also. With ultrasound, especially with our new machines, we're able to almost see one next to the other, within a nerve, a fascicle. That gives a fascicular pattern if you have a longitudinal scan. All those bra uh, black bands are nervous tissue and white is uh, the connective tissue. But be aware again, if there's fat around the nerve, it may be difficult to get uh, the differentiation to the surrounding areas. 
And this is very important if you do regional. For example, you see the red arrows. If you come not close enough to the nerve, the local anesthetic will go anywhere and not reaching your target. And this would be, for example, the right spot to go for this nerve, which, by the way, is an ulnar nerve. So near to, but not into, but not far away from the nerve. This is um, something we have to learn if you use ultrasound-guided regional, or if you apply ultrasound to regional anesthesia. Again, something not so well appreciated, the importance of bone surfaces. You can't go through bone, but you can use them ideally as landmarks throughout the body. So learn about the skeleton again if you do regional, and of course, bony surfaces. Just a few words to the uh, artifacts, acoustic shadowing, lateral shadowing that occurs from arteries again, and as I told you, sorry, as I told you, um, it's not only vessels, it is also, it is also other structures like tendons that may produce artifacts like lateral shadowing. This is a tendon, this is lateral shadowing through a tendon. Some nerves even do that. Not so well known again. Everybody knows about arteries and lateral shadowing. Nobody knows about tendons and nerves producing the same thing. And dorsal enhancement is very important. If you have an artery and posterior to it, dorsal, you have a brighter image. And this is in interesting because nerves may look brighter. And others are reverberation and mirror artifacts that come across the field. And scattering and rebounding. Important if nerves are running on bone or within osteofibrous tunnels. Um, just give you one example of that reverberation and rebound artifacts. You see an iron nerve, almost no echoes, not because he, this nerve has no connective tissue. It is because it is within its respective sulcus. And the most important of all is anisotropy. That means if you don't hit nerves at the right uh, projection of your ultrasound beam, you won't see anything. And again, it is always said in musculoskeletal ultrasonography, tendons are very anisotropic. And the same is true for nerves, especially if you have nerves that look very, very bright. And this is, for example, for the sciatic nerve. That means the brighter a nerve is, the more uh, will it be uh, probably anisotropic. That means not hitting it at right angles will diminish your image. And what I call uh, nerves looking like tendons, tendon-like nerves. Classical example is the sciatic nerve. And variability. If you have a look at the um, upper limb now, and we are in the center of the axilla looking through two muscles, which is the pact major and pact minor, and you will, should have uh, uh, recognized the cords around the artery, and they should lie like lateral, medial, and posterior. And in this individual, clearly seen, the lateral is on top of the artery. The medial is medial, but the posterior is also medial. This is variability. So you have to be prepared about that. And injection gets different, and your approach has to be adapted to the variability of your individual. That is why I call it individual sonoanatomy. So variability is very truly the law of life, as Sir William Osler said that. If you go to the axilla a scheme, you see the center of the axilla. You may have the lateral, the posterior, and the medial cord right around the artery. But in other individuals, it's more or less a whole nervous tissue. It depends on where is your fork of the median nerve, etc., etc. So again, the images will differ. And if you go for, if you go for example, a scanning through that area, and you see the musculoskeletal nerve coming off the lateral cord, and in some individuals it's very dark and black, and it's more bright in others. So it very much depends on where you scan nerves to get an idea how they look like. Again. Lateral shadowing, whenever you see those marks, you see that is an artifact. Lateral shedding of artery. And if you come to the clavipectoral triangle, this is our first region in the upper um, extremity that is uh, below the, the clavicle. You see there are three cords beautifully seen next to the artery, and all of those cords are lateral to the artery, not around the artery in the clavipectoral triangle, which is the classical uh, site of our vertical infraclavicular block. And you see, the nerves are all lateral to that artery. But there, of course, are also um, variable things you have to keep in mind. For example, you have two cords in this individual and clearly seeing the same thing, uh, sorry, clearly seeing the same thing in um, this individual where the ultrasound image is now displayed in a second. 
You see two cords and two cords next to the artery. And here's an artifact, which is again lateral shadowing, dividing this cord into parts. You have to be aware of that. And if you come to the base of the axilla, which is where you do your axillary uh, plexus block, again, two individuals, exactly the same scanning level and absolutely different topography of your great nerves, which is ulnar nerve, which is, uh, sorry, median nerve, ulnar nerve, radial nerve, and muscular cutaneous, completely different pictures, and this is pretty normal. And this is our advantage if you use ultrasound. You see that immediately and then act accordingly. If you come to the cubital fossa, you have two big nerves easily available, which is the median nerve and the radial nerve at the ventral side. And the radial nerve has a typical pattern again. You see the bubbles and you see the white stuff. But be aware of the fact this black bubble is not fascicle. This is a accompanying artery. So always be aware of accompanying arteries in different places. This is the median nerve far away from the artery in this case. And if you have another individual, it's absolutely near to the artery. But almost always, the median nerve will be ulna to the brachial artery. And if you have a look at the posterior side, you see the uh, ulnar nerve in its respective sulcus. You see it once near the epicondyle and once far away. And this is the better way to block it because if you go here, a lot of septi are present where you, your local anesthetic may go into the wrong direction. So, beautifully seen here the nerve, and you see all those septi and fascia layers. Quite in contrast, if you come up here, that's the same picture you've already seen. Immediately underneath the brachial fascia, very easy to reach on the nerve. Have a look at the fascicles, difference to that individual. Very, very small and very, very big fascicles. Again, the variability goes as far as to the histology. It's not only topographical anatomy. That is why I call it sonomorphology. Everybody of us has different nerves as far as their echogenicity is concerned, but not the pattern. If you come to the distal forearm, you see the median nerve and landmark uh, muscles or tendons are the flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi long, uh, palmarum, palmaris longus. But a lot of individuals will not have that muscle, so your reference is the flexor carpi radialis. But be aware again of variability. Have a look at that cross section. This is the median nerve very deep lying on top of pronator quadratus muscle, and it should lie here. That means if you put your probe here and go for a single shot for the median nerve, these two structures look exactly the same. And this should be the nerve in its typical position, and in fact, in this individual, it is deep, very deep. This is the nerve and not the tendon. So variability, again, is the law of life. Let's go to the examples, of course, only examples in the lower extremity, and one favorite of mine is the sciatic nerve. Why? Because this sciatic nerve always looks bright if you scan it at right angles. That means big nerve, the biggest nerve in the human body, but probably one of the most difficult to scan, especially for beginners, because it is so anisotropic. Wrong angle, no picture. That means bright, very bright, very bright. And it is tendon-like. That means a lot of connective tissue, which is uh, logical because of its mechanical uh, uh, stress during movements, etc. And again, for example, see where it lies within muscles or within fat. And this may be a real, real problem if it comes to the popliteal fossa, as I'll show you in a minute. So, bright, yes, big, yes, but very problematic as far as anisotropy is concerned. Have a look at that. This is correctly scanned, and here you have a wrong scanning technique, and the nerve is almost gone. Just hypoechoic stuff, and sometimes. And I do repeat that, uh, not without reasons, nerves are also anisotropic and not only tendons, and very, very much in the lower extremity, and especially if they have a lot of connective tissue. If you go to the gluteal region, you see the sciatic nerve coming out of the infrapyriform foramen, so our landmarks here are muscles, and keep in mind, if you do it very close to the sacrum, you can go to the deep parts, even to the sacral plexus, if you do it longitudinally, which is a good idea if you scan the sciatic nerve, because in many individuals, the longitudinal scan is sharper or better than the transverse scan, as far as the sciatic nerve is concerned. And be aware of variability. What happens here? Part of the sciatic nerve, exactly, the deep perineal nerve, uh, the, the, the fibular nerve, sorry, is going through the piriform muscle. This is the regular anatomy. Gluteus maximus, piriformis, plexus, or 
nerve. And then in this individual, part of it is piercing the pyriform muscle. You, all, you see this with your ultrasound uh, images. And if you go to the deeper areas, like going next to the sciatic nerve, you have the sciatic nerve here, you have landmark vessels like descending branch of inferior gluteal artery. So if you have that, keep that in mind and use them if you, get, if you have difficulties in finding nerves. And very medial, medial to the um, ischial spine is the pudendal nerve. This is not part of this lecture because it's Sonar Anatomy 1. At basics, I will address that uh, during the pain uh, lectures later on. This is now an example where the artery is next to the nerve. Look how beautiful this nerve is displayed. Very bright, longitudinal scan, and it's even brighter than the tendon underneath. So, in this individual, that sciatic nerve is brighter than the tendon of the obturator internus. And the one is a nerve and the other is a tendon. Keep that in mind. And what happens in the next picture? You see that artery is not next to the nerve, it is just going through the nerve. So if you're near to the outlet, infrapyriform outlet, be aware of variability again. And here's the picture, the anatomy picture. This is the, media, uh, the sciatic nerve, and the big artery, it's the inferior gluteal artery, is right piercing the nerve. So if you're in that area, be aware of that. Posterior aspect of thigh. Everybody of us knows that the bifurcation may vary at, at different levels. That means throughout the thigh, you will have one nerve or mid-thigh two nerves. That also differs. But very importantly, from an anatomic, anatomical point of view, you see this spot where the sciatic nerve comes most superficial, and this is very elegant to go infragluteal to block the nerve because it's so superficial. And if you scan it through the hamstrings, you see it's embedded between hamstrings and adductor muscles. This is the nerve. And very next to the nerve, there's tendinous stuff. And a lot of people misinterpret this part as posterior uh, cutaneous nerve of the thigh, which is absolutely uh, nonsense, because it's always underneath the fascia. Or it is subcutaneous more distally. So if you come to that picture, be aware of the brightness and this vessel. The sciatic nerve has no accompanying vessel, but the arterial supply is coming from anterior, from the femoral uh, artery. That means you have perforated arteries, and they may be very big. So if you're blocking the sciatic nerve, don't think there's no vessel around the area. And again, variability. In this individual, one, and in this two, at the same level. Two nerves separated, which is the fibula and the tibial nerve. By the way, even if you have early bifurcations, the one is brighter and the other is more dark. And the brighter one is always the tibial part, not the fibular part. So be aware of vessels. And now the popliteal fossa, I pointed out, it may be problematic. You all know the topography, which is uh, bordered by hamstrings and biceps femoris. And with the biceps femoris, you see the common fibular nerve and the straight cause of the tibial nerve. This is regular anatomy regular anatomy. To me, there's no normal anatomy. It's just variable anatomy. And if you have a look at the scan in this individual, within the triangle of the popliteal fossa, there's one nerve. It should have been bifurcated much more proximal. In this individual, it's not. By the way, there was a local anesthetic applied around the nerve. And you beautifully see the typical pattern of the nerve again. Scatic nerve, bright, but fascicles, perineurium, epineurium. And in this individual, this is the, um, of the anatomy background to this picture. You see in the cross section, this is our triangle, that the bifurcation of the sciatic nerve is very, very distal, almost at the, um, at the uh, popliteal crease. And in other individuals, you will have two nerves. And do not forget, common fibular and tibial nerves are always in the in the fat pad of the popliteal fossa. And a lot of people have um, fat pad uh, appearance in, in ultrasound, which is very similar to the nerves, and then it may be very difficult, not only in obese patients. It is a matter of what sort of fat you have within your uh, regions, and we call that good or bad fat. You know about that? Bad fat is if you can't diminish, uh, distinguish between nerves and fat. Or if your fat is structured like being a lot of um, 
artifacts, ultrasound physically uh, explainable phenomenons, etc., etc. So in this individual, you have a clear picture of the tibial nerve, and you won't have a clear picture in this individual. And one of the pitfalls is seen here. Have a look at that hypoechoic spot. This is not a nerve. This is a fat pad within a fat pad. So be aware of those pitfalls. Underneath is the nerve, and this is no nerve. Be aware of that. It comes to the retromalleolar fossa, where we will find a typical arrangement of our topography. In front, very near to the malleolus, is the flexor tendons. So first of all is tibialis posterior, and then we have the uh, flexor digitorum longus, and covered is the flexor hallucis. It's deep. That means you have the vascular bundle and posterior to it, in many, many individuals, you will have the tibial nerve. By the way, there is no anterior and posterior tibial nerve. There's an anterior and posterior tibial artery, but only one tibial nerve. If you read that in, in uh, books, just cross it out. And this is the scanning level. A little bit more proximal, best way, just to get good acoustic coupling with gel, etc. And you will see in an anatomical cross-section, this is anterior medial, this is posterior, uh, anterior lateral, this is posterior medial. You see the tendons, and they, even in the anatomical cross-section, look very, very much the same than the nerve. And this is represented in the anatomical picture also. If you have a look at the artery here, without labeling, you could think that this is the nerve. No, this is a tendon within fleshy part of the flexor um, digitorum uh, longus muscle. So be aware of those things. Even in the flexor hallucis longus, you may have bright spots. They mimic the tibial nerve. And if you know the topography, you know where to go for your nerve to block it accordingly. So, tibial nerve, and last but not least, the femoral nerve in the, uh, in the femoral trigone. Be aware of the fact that this nerve may be a little bit, part of it may be a little bit posterior to the artery, like in this individual. This is not the nerve, this is the nerve. And due to acoustic shadowing, which is the lateral shadowing phenomenon, you may see partly of the, the part of the femoral nerve is just gone. So this is one of the reasons why we never should go at the medial side of the femoral nerve because you just see this part. You can't see it. You go to the lateral side and you're on the safe side as far as topography is concerned and as far as clinical application is concerned. And you have two fascia, which is fascia later and fascia iliaca. And there's a sort of triangle between this, these two fascia and medially you have the artery and the nerve is within that triangle. But in some individuals it may be far lateral to the artery, and this is also one of the vari variations you have to keep in mind. Regularly, it's close to the artery, but not always. And fascia layers. This is the femoral nerve. Have a look at that. If you draw a line, lateral part of the artery, and you see almost half of the nerve is gone in your ultrasound image. Be aware of those facts. And variability as far as vessels is concerned. You may have the deep circumflex ilium artery very deeply springing off the femoral artery. This may be right in front of the femoral nerve where you block it. And have a look at that distance. This is one of the variants I just was talking about. Vein, medial artery, lateral, and most lateral, the femoral nerve, but a big distance between artery. And this is pretty normal, pretty normal. So keep that in mind. And this is the corresponding ultrasound image, femoral artery, distance, 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 and nerve on top of iliopsoas muscle, which, by the way, has always a groove where the nerve lies in. So distance has to be taken into account. And from the femoral nerve, the saphenous nerve, there are also important variants, like the infrapatellar branch may rise far proximally and be on top of sartorius instead of coming here. And you see all those uh, details with ultrasound. That means the saphenous nerve is underneath sartorius, and this little spot is the infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve. You will never see the saphenous nerve at that location. If you see a nerve there, it is the infrapatellar branch variable, of course. And if you go to the adductor canal, of course, you see a beautiful saphenous nerve underneath the adductor uh, membrane or vasto adductor membrane. But be aware of a pitfall, which is the motor branch to the vastus medialis. It always looks very similar, and even as far as uh, diameter is concerned. So this was a quick rush through two extremities, and I hope that I could answer the question why we need anatomy. Of course we need anatomy, and if you want to apply it to clinical practice, so the importance of sonar anatomy in our practice is obvious because we are seeing what you're doing. But be aware of the fact that you only see what you know. 
And this is why you're here. Your knowledge should be very, very good, very excellent, or become excellent. And I'd like to thank you for your interest and kind attention.